let's get into the time for the talk about the game here, guys, because we got the we got the game coming up here, and that's that's the big one here. The Seahawks yet again, again. It's almost like as bad as like starting off every year with the Cowboys, which thank God we didn't have it this year. But it's like that was like the trend for like, like ten years, and now it's like Just somehow we played the Seahawks every single year. Now this is the third year in a row. You think we the, are? You think the Maris got? The um, you think the Maris got a, a good travel package over to Seattle? Well, maybe because it's so close to where Steve Tisch lives in California that he was asking oh. for. It. Maybe that's what it is. Could be. He's over there making some movies with Mara's daughter, probably, or something like that. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> so, you know, with, or, with Mara's son-in-law walking Phoenix there. Who knows? But, <laughs> but, yeah, so let's go into things. We're going to break it down for you guys mm-hmm. um, for offense, defense, what to do, who to look for at that point, because we assume you all know who everybody is on the Giants, obviously, but you might not know too much as far as you know, who's on the Seahawks. So we're going to give you guys a little bit of info on that. Before we do, though, so Rob doesn't yell at me. I was going to say. He likes likes to yell at me. All right. Let's get into that game here because this is is an interesting team to talk about there because it's a team in transition. Obviously, they go away from Pete Carroll. They got McDonald, the former defensive coordinator from the Ravens, that's with them for several years during a lot of successful time there in Baltimore. And he's taken over. And honestly, it kind of feels like a very similar team being led by a new voice. The defense minus last week, which we'll get into that here and we talk about, you know, the, what's going on in Seattle. What's, what's doing pretty good there. So let's get right into when we're on offense here. Because we're going on the offensive here, guys. We're doing it. We're putting up some points this week. We are not settling for field goals. I am not going to sit and have Greg <laughs> Joseph be the player that we could get next week. We appreciate the five kicks, but God damn it, someone's got to get a touchdown. So true. <laughs> so real quick, guys, we're going to go over. Uh, I know Rob and I, are our, our, our show, uh, we're going to do it tomorrow. We're going to be live again Thursday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Shameless plug. Uh, we'll do our, our parts about the, the injuries there, but we'll give you guys a quick rundown as well for you guys of what's going on there on offense. So the big one, obvious, Malik Neighbors got the concussion. He's still in the protocol. Um, I'm hearing good things about him, but it's still a concussion. Until they're cleared, you never know. Because it's not the teams that do it, it's the doctors that have to do it. And I always say doctors love the CYA. And if you don't know what that is, I'll get in trouble on YouTube if I say it too often. <laughs> but they CYA the hell out of themselves at that point. And they're not going to release anybody until they're 100% positive. It's 100% safe. And I actually 100% agree with that because, again, you're talking, you want this guy healthy in the long run. You want him not having any long-term effects the rest of his life, either from playing football as well. So, um, Devin Singletary also popped up on the injury report here with a groin injury, and that popped up today. And that's really the first anybody heard about any kind of, you know, major potential concern there for him. But he did not practice today because of that injury. Limited in practice, Wandale Robinson with a heel injury as well. So. You know, usually the heel of our offense is Daniel Jones, but apparently this is the heel that's hurting now. It's Wandell Robinson's. So <laughs> we got a we got a couple of big game guys. I mean, let's be honest, Bleak neighbors out of this game. This is a totally different offense. Totally different offense. 100%. You know. Devin Singletary out of this offense. We talked about it. Guy averaged only one yard per carry against the Cowboys, but he's still the best veteran, and I should say only veteran, really, running back. Only veteran. But I know one thing Rob and I will be happy about if hypothetically he doesn't play, not that we're rooting for him not to play, but if he doesn't play, you know what time it is, Rob? It's turbo time. It's turbo time. <laughs> Get to the turbo chopper. Yeah. <laughs> Get to the end zone. Miller been sleeping on the <laughs> practice squad the whole entire time, and I've been dying to see this kid in an actual NFL game. Uh, we're, we're huge fans of him overall. First off, great story. Um, everything he overcame in his childhood and everything like that. Uh, but going on to a major school, getting kind of screwed over by the NCAA. And then, you know, all of a sudden, literally, like, at his pro day, would have had the best numbers of any running back in this draft if he was actually draftable. You know, like, this this kid basically hasn't played football in two years. Nobody knows what to expect from him. All I know is he'll probably be better than Eric Gray. That's not saying much, be but he'll probably be better than Eric Gray at this point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're not Eric Gray fans. No, me neither. Fair warning. We put him Fair in the warning. friend zone. Yes, he's he he needs to be put on the practice squad. Tracy, though. Tracy, I like the only thing yes, with Tracy yes. is I think I think the big thing is we got to recognize is that he's basically a third down back. 
Hmm. He's not going to be in between the tackles back. He may develop into that eventually. But you can't force the guy who's still learning the running back position into doing something he's not prepared to do yet. He's not like the rest of these guys. He's been playing it for you know five years of pop one or four years of high school, you know three years of college, whatever. He's played it for two years in college, one to which he didn't really see the field that much. You know, you're, you, I think we're asking a lot from him, and if he delivers, great on him. But I think people need to recognize where this kid's coming from. He's going to need a lot of work to learn this position. He was still in the process of learning in college. And to put him in a, in a position where he's your number one, number two, I give him credit for handling like he has because that's asking a lot of a guy who's still learning the position as well as learning the transition from college to the NFL. That's putting a lot on his shoulders. And I think, again, Eric Wright, in my mind, should be gone. Turbo Miller should be there. But at the very least, if Dante, if if I'm sorry, if, uh, Devin Singletary is injured, I think you will see uh, Turbo Miller this, this, this game. And I honestly think nothing would shock me with him. He's a guy that I really think he could do fall flat in his face. I'm like, he's a rookie. Hasn't played in two years. What do you expect? Yeah. Or he could do really well. I'm like, every go. And Rob will be going doing his Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation the entire game. Every week. Constantly. Every single you time. You know what? My fantasy football ball. teams. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we'll see what happens. Again, we want Singletary to play, though. He's the only guy we have at that point that's a veteran proven running back on this roster so um let's get into though the injuries on the seahawks which is interesting because i know unless somebody else sees something different i looked about an hour ago they still had not released an injury report with the seahawks but the big thing with them injury wise is their defense so last week when they got absolutely demolished here by the lions defensive tackle byron murphy the second hamstring out for the game Leonard Williams, our old friend there, with a rib injury, out for the game. Uh, Boye Mafe, knee injury, out for the game. Uh, edge rusher, I'm going to probably mispronounce his name. I apologize ahead of time. I tried to get this one down before the show. Uh, it's Uchenna Nasu, knee injury. Linebacker Jerome Baker, hamstring injury. And then Julian Love leaves the first half injured against the Lions and doesn't come back in. So all of those guys are questionable. You're talking about six players on defense alone that are now questionable for this game this is completely a different defense potentially than what you had seen going into this and this defense has done good but they gave up 42 points to the lions last week jared goff was 18 of 18 really didn't have an incompletion the entire damn game and almost put up 300 yards against them so it wasn't like and it was his first deep, receiving deep, deep touchdown down. yeah yeah which is pretty impressive yeah, that was they three couldn't stop the run. He was he was a good fantasy guy to have. That's for damn sure. They couldn't stop anything. Yeah. No. They could not stop anything. But and that's the problem going into this game is that what Seahawk defense will you see? Because if they're healthy, they're not a bad defense. As I said, their new head coach is a defensive coach at that point who has a lot of respect in the league for what he does. It's a matter of how many of these guys will go. So as we're recording this here Wednesday night, we don't have the information to know that yet. So, you know, we got to kind of keep an eye on the injury report as the week goes. And I'll never say I hope bad for players because it's their body. You want them healthy. But if they want to give an extra week to heal up fully, I'm not going to be upset. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You got to think about your health first. Exactly. Think about your kids. Think about the kids. Someone think of the children. (laughs) The children out there. Um, So. But again, though, they've been about an average defense overall. They're averaging 21, three, uh, 21.3 points a game. They're giving up overall. Uh, but they've been a very efficient defense. They're allowing only 28.9% conversion on third downs. That's fourth best in the NFL. Um, they're um, 25% conversion rate on fourth downs. That's second best. But they've also been high in the red zone. They're uh, actually say high average, I guess you'd say. 53.3% because that's 15th overall. Mm-hmm. So it's been kind of a bend but don't break kind of system at that point is kind of what they have in place at that point where they're getting themselves in favorable position for thirds downs if they are giving up a big play they're limiting it down to a a field goal and that's signs of a well-coached team guys absolutely a well-coached team that's the kind of stats that you can go okay whoever's doing the scheme is doing something right at that point and as much as we love to give credit to the players i think that that's what it shows is that mcdonald's is having an impact on this uh on this uh team overall and how this defense is being run especially compared to last year when they had a lot of big names had a couple of really bad games and some bad performances as a result 
Yeah. Frick the um, Sam, you and I talked about Leonard Williams last season and us missing him in the run defense. And I think what's key for the Giants is establishing that run, getting the duo pushes, right, with Runyon and Schmitz up front, Runyon and Andrew Thomas, right? You want to get those guys. And Singletary banged up. We don't know if he's going to play. Um, I'm not too concerned yet. It's only Wednesday. But, Sam, I definitely miss Leonard Williams. And <laughs> I really, really hope that, he does not play for our sake because we couldn't <laughs> establish a run against Dallas's weak front last week, and Seattle's front is much stronger. The teeth of their defense is solid, especially with Terrell Dodson and Tyrus Knight, too, as their starting linebackers. So Leonard Williams is a tough cookie to crack. Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, Devin Singletary is basically, like, our best bet here. And so mm -hmm. if he doesn't play, I mean, I'm sure Tracy can get the job done. Or Turbo Miller if he if he comes up. To Turbo the time. <laughs> yeah, Turbo. The active roster. You can say we have to do it every time. I'm sorry, we have to do it every time. Yeah, I respect that. That's totally <laughs> fine. Um, but yeah, I I I was so dead set on the fact that Devin Singletary was going to run all over the Cowboys defense last week, and the fact that it just didn't happen does not make me feel good. I mean, he completely messed up my parlay. It was just not good. I was like expecting him to run at least sixty yards, and it just that didn't was happen. the parfait. <laughs> yeah, you got me all excited. <laughs> I love <a> parfait. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that does sound nice, actually. Um, but it? yeah, <laughs> I McDonald's. Just... We said parfait. Next thing you know, <laughs> oh, God, you made me hungry. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think running is going to be a huge part of this game, especially if the defense on the Seattle side is so messed up. But then we have to also think about, okay, well, if we don't have a good run game, then we have to throw the ball. And it's like, then who are we throwing to? All right, Wandale Robinson. I'm sure he's going to play even despite the heel. Don't know. I think we need to put Jalen Hyatt on a freaking milk carton because haven't seen him around. It's like if we're going to be at least putting points on the board, I'm not saying that we're going to win this game because I just don't really think it's possible. Um, but – like, we have to have guys down the field. And, like, what about like, – I saw some people in the comments talking about it. What about our tight end presence? Like, yep. we're just not even utilizing that at all. And I think – I'm a huge Daniel Bellinger girl. I love Daniel Bellinger. I think he could be a huge asset to this team. And we are just not utilizing him the correct way. So, if the run That's is not – in a row. I'm curious what's going on behind the scenes at Bellinger. I feel like something behind the scenes that we don't know about is going on there. And mm – -hmm. This is one of those scenarios that, you know, as fans, we want to know everything going on. Mm -hmm. But I, I kind of got to give it to the organization for the fact that it hasn't leaked out yet. Because something is going on. Same as you mentioned Hyatt. Something's going on there as well. Because they gave Hyatt every opportunity to be Slayton in the, in the season before it started. They right. wanted him to. You know, Hyatt's their guy. Slayton is not. Slayton's probably not the long-term plans. They want Hyatt in the long-term plans. They did everything they could for him to beat him out. And he couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Yeah. I don't know about Belly. I, I can see him having a better year, you know, now that Waller's not over there and everyone's trying to, like, throw it to Waller and that he was supposed to be our number one weapon in the receiving. Like, I think that took away from Bellinger's play. Um, he's still been blocking you know, when he's in, but sure. he also hasn't he's had any holding yards. Yeah. Touche. That was brutal. Yeah. He's had a lot of them the last couple of years now. Right. And he's and, third on our on, on our depth chart, really, at that tight end. At least if you look at snap count wise. I don't know where they have him officially on the roster here, right. but if you look at snap count, Manhurts has beaten him out for snaps at this point. You Fine. know, it's almost like you're almost like shocked to see him on the field at this point. It's right. not to the and level then, of Hyatt, obviously, but it's definitely noticeable that he's not on as often as you'd expect. Yeah, there's a lot of twelve personnel with Theo Johnson and Chris Manhurts. And Theo Johnson yep. I think eventually as we get closer to the middle part of the season within the next month or so, you're going to see him get more targets offensively. You know, he's been learning the playbook. Tight ends coach Tim Kelly coming over from the Titans. I think he's going to be a huge part of this offense. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this. If Neighbors doesn't play, he might be the second option. He might be the second option because you're looking at Wandale. Um, you know, they'll throw here and there to Tracy. If Singletary doesn't play, then you're looking at, really, Theo Johnson. I don't trust 
Slayton to make too many plays. I don't trust him to be a five catch a game guy anymore. Um, I'm not saying he's bad, but that's just the reality where it is right now. And then Hyatt doesn't touch the field. So who's next? It's really Theo Johnson. And you could pick apart that middle of the field. Theo Johnson, all in Tyrese Knight in the senior bowl. His average depth of target at Penn State was incredible. So that's one player as we're talking about the Giants. How are they going to win this game? Play action, bootlegs, get him in open space. He can make people miss. He is, in my personal opinion, he catches the ball better than Evan Ingram did when he was here. Um, from what I've seen so far in training camp, in practice, you haven't seen it in the games yet, and I really you want to see mean it. He actually catches games. it. Yes. Drop it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also got to check yeah. the rock a little bit better. We got to yeah. check a little farther too, but we'll get, we'll get into that part of there. But yeah, yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll have to see what happens because like there's a lot of injuries here to both mm-hmm. important people in, on that on our side on offense and their side on defense. And like and like we said, it's like you have to keep an eye on kind of. And I don't like to do this on a regular basis, but this is one of those games you have to kind of stalk this injury report if you're going to put money in this game, especially because who's going to be healthy and who's not going to be healthy is going to determine a lot of what happens in this game potentially at that point because. If the Lions can put up 42 points against this team, there's no reason I think we can't put up 25. And if the defense has a good game, a couple of things go right our way. You never know what's going to happen there at that point. So, you know, we mentioned the the run defense. So run-wise there, um, the uh, Seahawks are giving up 4.3 yards per carry. That's 14th best in the NFL. Uh, 116.3 yards per game. That's 14th as well. So they're basically an average run defense. So we really do need to get it going. This, I'm tired of the excuses. This run game has to get it going. And when we made the pitiful Dallas Cowboy run defense, which is one of the worst in the league, we made them look really good. Really good. And that's got to stop. That Something's got to be figured out with that because there's too much talent on this team to do that. Devin Singletary is an established running running back in this league. We got we talked about it before. We got a talented offensive line now, which is Sounds weird to stay still as a Giants fan, but you know we have a very talented offensive line here. We got to get this going. We got to get this figured out because you got to take the pressure off Daniel Jones, who quite frankly can't handle it. He's not good enough to carry a team. You know, again, I we'll get hit for that later on in the comment section, I'm sure, because the Daniel Jones people love to attack me for it when I say stuff like that. I root for the kid like he wouldn't believe he's a giant. I wanted this, I want this guy to throw 400 yards on Sunday and get five touchdowns. I want that. I'm just, I also want, are you, know, you playing? Pony, I also want a pony in a brand new beach house. I just realistic things here, people, realistic things. That's where we're at here, you know. So I just want him to have a little more support around him from the run game. So he has a better chance to succeed. Now, the strength of this team, though, really for the Seahawks, though, on defense has been the pass defense. They're allowing just 6.4 yards um, per per catch there. Uh, That's ninth best in the NFL. Um, They're allowing 167.5 yards per game, which is seventh best in the NFL as well. And they're sacking quarterbacks on 10.5% of passing down with the sixth best. That being said, they're also allowing 66.7 completion percentage. That's 19th best. And they're averaging and getting interceptions, just 1.7% of passing plays, 17th best as well. So what that tells you is they're allowing catches. What they're doing is they're kind of in the, almost like that mini prevent style where they're going to let you get the short stuff and they're going to stop you from getting the long stuff. And to me, guys, that plays into our strength because we can't throw the ball past 10, 15 yards anyway as it is. Let's be honest. Anytime Daniel Jones Pretty attempts much. to, he's off. He just doesn't have that, that. I don't know if it's a neck injury. I don't know yeah. if it's a confidence thing. You know, it's a whole different conversation. But the numbers tell you that he's what two of thirteen, I think, on the year right now over twenty yards. Correct. Yep. And every time he does it, the guy is like open. I'm not saying he's wide open, ten yards of freedom there, but he's got a couple of steps in the guy, and it's just overthrown or underthrown or whatever the case may be. I mean, you all remember was the last week, the week before, where neighbors ripped the one ball from the defender at that point. They only saved the interception. That was one of those classic examples. It was underthrown, and neighbors had to come back for it. And luckily, he had the hand strength to do it. Um, but this plays into what we do. We do short passes. We hope for some yak yards at that point, you know, from guys like neighbors, guys like Wandell. And I think it actually, weirdly enough, actually, weird to say that, I think our passing offense can actually do a little damage to this team just based on how we play the ball. 
Because if that's what they're doing, you're playing into the hands of what we want to do anyway. If you're going to give me a five-yard gain, I'm going to take that all day long and use my passing game, almost like a run game, and hope we can get some yak yards and break something one or two times during the game at that point and have it be play that year. Because we have a better chance of neighbors or Robinson doing that than we do Daniel Jones throwing a 30-yard bomb down the field. No disrespect to him, it's the truth. I mean, what's Wandell know for? No, get the get that yak. Yak be yak. So. <laughs> oh, please get that touchdown back. High volume. <laughs> a lot of high volume with him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We said it going into this year, we thought he was a hundred catch guy all year long. And at this point, he may be like get the record for the least yards with a hundred catches in a season. Mm. Like I feel like he's gonna be like a hundred catches, eight hundred yards the way things are going, which is insane to think seven, about. Seven fifty. Yeah, like that, but that's I, I mean, I, Rob knows I love doing the math. I can do the math and find out what he's up to here at this point here. But I mean, that's that's the kind of thing you're looking at with him. But that kind of game plays into what the Seahawks are giving up this year. So if that's what they're going to give up, take it. That's what we do best anyway. Is those short passes? That's right. what we have done. So you know, I'm I'm kind of curious to see what this offense can do. And if you can get a, a high percentage volume kind of thing like that then you can get down the field and you can score some plays. And maybe this is a game that gets a little confidence for DJ because he needs confidence, regardless of the injury he's affecting him or whatever. He needs confidence because he's looking over his shoulder knowing that if we keep losing, he's eventually going to get benched to prevent injury is- you know, cause issues. And he's not going to see the field ever again. Not with the Giants, at least. Yeah, and this is also another game, like we were saying before, with the tight ends getting in their slant plays. Yeah, you know, Wandell, a lot of slants, a lot of play action. You got to set that bad boy up, especially yeah, if you don't have Wandell's on pace for 111, 111 catches is what he's on pace for right now. And if the season ended, he'd be at 800, 825 yards. That's what yeah. it would be at, this, at the pace he's at currently in 17 games. <laughs> like I said, that's got to be a record. I'll, I can look that up real quick, but it's got to be a record. Yeah. <laughs> As he looks it up. Yeah. My buddy Brian just said Daniel Jones, only two wow. 400 plus yard passing games in his career. And my friend Brian is a Bucks fan. He from Clear Clearwater. This is the guy from Clearwater, Drew, like you. Uh, there we go. Clearwater. One of them against the Bucks, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, we might be waiting a while for it because he doesn't take shots yeah. down the field. And when he does, it's overthrow. And, of course, you got a trio of ex-Giants on the defensive side of the ball as well. Again, we said we might not see some of these guys because of injuries, but Julian Love, Leonard Williams, and our old pal Jonathan Hankins, who played with the you know, New York Giants back in the 1970s. It feels like at this point, it feels like so long ago. We drafted him like 2011 yeah. was we drafted him, I think I want to say it was. Off 2013. The head. Oh, 13, yeah. Ohio State yeah. second-round pick of him, second right? Guy. But yeah, yeah. Good player was one of that – String of really good tackles we kept on drafting but not resigning for some reason. The guy like Linville Joseph comes to mind, obviously, that kind of same kind of mold at that point there. And he's had a nice long career again, he's still playing, you know, 11 years after he's drafted. That's way beyond the average at that point there. So, mm-hmm. uh, we'll see what kind of reunion we have there. So, uh, let's get on to when we're on defense here because everybody loves talking about some of the players that the Seahawks have on offense. I guess they got a trio of really good receivers. They have a really good running back. Uh, they got a quarterback that I've heard can take a pretty good punch in the locker room. So, you know, they have a lot of interesting players there overall. So Seahawks versus the Giants when we're on defense here. So first off on the injury front there for you guys there. So on our side, Drew Phillips got the calf injury, did not practice today. Adoree Jackson, same thing, did not practice with a calf injury as well. Brian Burns is uh, got a groin injury. Uh, he's limited to practice, was there though today. Uh, the big comeback here, Matthew Adams, who I know might not seem like a big name on paper to come back there, but he's practiced for the first time from coming off his quad injury after starting the season on the IR. This was the guy we acquired from the Browns and free agency there. Big special team guy. Um, and a guy that you'll be hearing that name a few times there on special teams if he is active in the game. He's the guy that's all over the place in that. For whatever reason, there's some players that are just built for special teams and can't do squat on defense for the most part. 
he's one of those guys. It's, it's, it's honest truth. I mean, he's like he's like a better version of Carter Coughlin is also out right now as well, obviously. But he's like a better version of Carter Coughlin there. He could be potentially the best special team player we have, obviously, outside of, you know, kicker, punter kind of thing, their coverage guy there. Um on the Seahawks, again, they haven't listed anything as far as their injury report yet. So guys have to kind of keep an eye on that there. But they're definitely much healthier on offense than what they have been on defense. Defense has been where they had all their issues there. Uh, the big thing on the Seahawks, they're a very pass-heavy offense. They will pass, 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 followed by some pass, 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 pass. It's insane how much this team's passing right now. 64.4% of the, pass, uh, the plays on offense are passes. That's the third highest in the league. Uh, they have a 72.33 completion percentage, second highest. They average 39.8 passes per game, which is the highest in the NFL. And they're averaging 280.1 passing yards per game. Again, first in the NFL. Now, you can put a little bit of an asterisk on that because of the fact that Walker, their lead running back, has been out for two of the four games. But he was in versus the Lions and Gino still put up 56 passes. So you can say it's a possibility that's partially the problem, but based on last week, I would say that's probably not the problem. That's just what they've decided to well, do on their offensive side of the ball there. Yeah, when you're playing from behind, you kind of have to throw the chuck the rock a lot more. Well, yeah, I mean, that one game, yeah, but that was their only loss they've had in the season. So, you know, it's, it's but yeah, 59 passes is, is absolutely insane. That's like two games put together, or like you know, Daniel Jones' entire season in 23. But you know, it's just it's, it's crazy. It's just, I know, I know. I mean, I can't help well, they got three good receivers, so they're gonna throw it right. I yeah, I mean, three big ones. So, I mean, Gino's got 1182 yards in the season, four touchdowns, four interceptions, and a 91.2 passer rating. So, we know that occasionally he's forgetting what team he plays for and throwing at the wrong team. When you got a four to four ratio, that's not the best in the world, guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, the big uh three there, DK Metcalf, who is guys, if you haven't ever been to a game where Metcalf is playing, he looks different in person. That man is a mountain of a man and a beast of a wide receiver. Like, I, I got to see him at the Pro Bowl last year, I went there in Orlando, and I'm telling you, he was mm -hmm. like, he's the size of a linebacker. It's crazy how big this guy is in person when you see him. Um, 24 catches, 366 yards, two touchdowns on the season. Uh, a guy that Rob and I were huge on coming out of the draft there last year, Jackson Smith uh, Najigba, who we said was going to be the best wide receiver by far in this draft, and then obviously got you know put to the you know put in the corner there and kind of forgotten about a little last year because he went to a team that had some really good receivers. Well, now he's got 25 catches, which leads the team. 266 yards now in his second season, playing out of the slot position primarily. And he's actually passed, at least volume-wise, Tyler Lockett as the second receiver on this on the squad now. Lockett's got 18 catches, 199 yards, and one touchdown. Lockett's the guy that actually is in the last year of his deal, will probably be moving on at the end of the season because they also have to try to re-sign Geno Smith and he needs some money to do that. So, you know, Smith, Smith and the Jigba is having a, a, a fun role of trying to develop into that second receiver while the guy who's supposed to be the second receiver is still there. And if he is playing, Drew Phillips is going to have quite the matchup in the slot there against them. I'm Big actually job. very curious to Love see him. that matchup. Very curious because Drew Phillips has got a lot of praise, as he should. He's been playing very well, very aggressive against the run specifically, which I love seeing out of a corner. But this is a big name guy for him to have to go against here on Sunday. If he Again, if he's healthy. If he's not, then I pray for us. Because I'm not sure who's going to cover these three yeah. guys, honestly. Like, who are you going to put up? you got to have Banks, who struggled the last couple weeks. He's going to probably go against DK Metcalf. And you Metcalf, to. to be honest, is wow. a much better player than he is. He needs help. I know. Like that's the, We're all making the same face right now. Like you know, That's <laughs> not good. Like Cooper looked really bad week three going into that game. He had, what, like 30 yards receiving in the first two games combined or something like that? Like, absolutely nothing. He looks like an all-pro against Banks. You know, C.D. Lamb didn't do a lot of volume, but he had that one move where he made that double move on him at that point, and Tyler Newbin came down and went to the wrong spot and didn't provide the right help for Banks either. So it kind of goes on both those guys. But that big touchdown play, which, again, if that play doesn't happen, the Giants might have won the game. I'm not trying to put that one play and banks on the whole game. There's a whole lot of mistakes we can pinpoint if this one thing didn't happen. But that's one of those plays that you look at from last week. Um, 
you know, you got Mc, McLeod back at that point. You got Flott. I mean, that may be your trio that you're going to have this week going against these guys. And if you're going to ask people who you'd feel more confident having, Banks, Flott, and McLeod, or Metcalf, Smith, Najigba, and Lockett, I'm sure most people would take that Seattle lineup in that in that bet if they had to take yeah. one of those two. You give me two so, of those three in Seattle, I feel more confident. Yeah. That's it's a little that's a little scary of a matchup there. I mean, even if you yeah. put Phillips in and a Dory Jackson, I'm still a little scared for that matchup. They have a really good trio of receivers. Um, they have two guys also that will get involved with the passing game, or not as much. Uh, Zach uh, Charbonnet, the uh, backup running back, who's also had to be their starting running back a couple times this season because of injuries, uh, and tight end Noah Fance. Both of Jake base. I don't want to get the full exact. They just a couple catches a game. It's what they're those kind of guys. Um, yeah. On the offensive line, Charles Cross has really developed this season Great into point. being a good left tackle. He got an 84.3 PFF rate on the season so far. Um, really, like I said, a really improved season here for him so far to start. The rest of the line hasn't been the best. And I spent some time today because I had a little my day off and a little cleaning around the house and all. You know, the, 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 the good husband things, keep the wife happy, happy wife, happy life. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> she's like, smart man. <laughs> <laughs> but I was listening to, and I always try to do this before we do our show on previews, and I was listening to podcasters that do the Seahawks specifically. And I'm telling you guys, when you listen to these guys talk about their offensive line, it's like we're talking about the Giants' offensive line the last couple of years. They love Cross. They have a lot of faith in Cross. The rest of it, eh, <laughs> not so good. Especially on the right side of the line. That's their Achilles heel in this line. And I really want to see if we're going to do something creative to specifically attack that. Avoid, for lack of a better term, because that's what we're going to be doing, avoid Charles Cross as best you can and throw everything good in the kitchen sink at the right side. Their guard, Anthony Bradford, has a 43.3 PFF grade. And their right tackle, Stone Forsythe, has a 49 PFF grade. Like I said, guys, we're all Giants fans. We remember those numbers. Those are the numbers we've had for players that played for us for how many years? That's like an offensive line for the Giants. For once, we can be the team that plays the crappy offensive line. How great does that sound? The roles are reversed. The fortunes are upon us. <laughs> it is It is time there. So, yeah, I mean, and Burns has got to show up, guys. Like, I, I, I hate to say people are like oh like there's there's nuances to this thing and this and, but no I'm sorry you're getting paid thirty freaking million dollars a year I know that's not a fault of yours but with it's like you know we're gonna do a little Uncle Ben here at that point okay say. with great paychecks comes big responsibility okay mm. like that's what we're down to you wanted to get paid it wasn't like you were like oh just what do you think I'm worth? No, he came out publicly said multiple times, I want $30 million a year. I'm a top talent in this league. I'm a top pass rusher. I don't know about y'all, but I haven't seen it. I have not seen yeah. it. And I we said when the trade was, was made, I love the trade. We didn't give up a lot for him. I didn't love the contract. He's not a $30 million pass rusher. He's not. And unfortunately, now we're in a position where we're paid him as such. He has to perform as such. Whether fair or not, you ask for it. We're gonna we're gonna ask for that production back now, and this is the kind of game you're gonna need him on because if Geno Smith is able to sit behind that pocket and do what he got to do, we're gonna be in for a long day, guys, because he's looked really good this season. And it sounds weird still in year three of Geno Smith's resurgence. Say Geno Smith looks really good, but I'm telling you, in Seattle, they are loving them some Geno Smith right now. Like they're saying, they point, like don't care what it what it takes. Do the extension now. Resign him. Just figure it out right now. Don't even let this go to the bottom line. He's the best player in the team. They say that's that's how much love yeah. Geno Smith has right now from the people in Seattle. I'll tell you the locked on uh, Seahawks uh, people. They love him. They love them some Geno right now. Like I I I have it's like, weird. Wow. I guess being a Giant fan, we haven't loved the quarterbacks Eli left. And even then, let's be honest, they didn't love him that much when he was when he was there. There's a lot of people that hated him then too. You know. I mean, um, I mean, also if you're in a Giants fan, you're in a Giants market. So you hear about Geno Smith when he was drafting all the you know nonsense he went through, but now he's on the Eugene Smith train, just chugging along through Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So real quick on their running uh, game here. So Kenneth Walker uh, the third Esquire, because I just I feel like saying Esquire after that. And you put the third. I have to call you Esquire at the end. 
Um, <laughs> only played two games so far this year. 32 carries, 182 yards, 5.7 yard per carry average, four touchdowns. That's pretty damn impressive to get in two games, guys. Uh, yeah. Zach Charbonnet, um, who has the most alcoholic name in the NFL, uh, 42 <laughs> carries on the season, 156 yards, 3.7 yards per carry, three touchdowns. He's a solid backup. They have a solid one-two punch. They really do. 3.7 yards per carry, again, doesn't sound very impressive. But when you put it to the fact that for two of those games, instead of being the change of pace back, he was the back. And he's not good enough to be the back, but he's a good change of pace. It's a good one-two punch, guys. But they don't rush very often. We talked about it. They run, 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 run. They literally pass twice as often as as they throw. I'm sorry, but run pass twice as often as they run. But what they also do is they score touchdowns twice as often from the run game as they do pass, which is interesting. So when it gets down to the goal line, that's what they're doing. They're going ahead and they're running the ball right into the end zone. And what's weird is, as bad as the Giants' defense has been against the run this year, guys, that's the one area we've done well on. We literally lead the league in something. Who would have thought the Giants lead the yeah. league in something positive? Positive. Not, not um, interceptions. Allowing just point three rushing touchdowns per game, which is best in the NFL. Wow. So I will say sometimes that's because of the fact that they, you know, we get up long passing plays, and that's why they get touchdowns instead. But, you know, listen, I'll take a win where I can get a win. Okay, I'll take a win where I can get a win. Don't you break down your semantics. (laughs) I'm just trying to take a win where I can take a win. We have a positive something we will lead the league in. It's positivity, people. People (laughs) complain we're too negative on this show. We're not too negative, damn it. We gave you positive. They complain about you being too negative. (laughs) Even though we gave an asterisk too, but whatever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All righty, guys. Let's go over some keys for the game here because obviously uh, again, a little bit time-wise here. I know you guys had to get going soon yourselves there at that point. So let's get into some keys for the game here. So we'll do, let's do this round Robin style. So Tom, we'll go clockwise there. Let me, and I'll, I'll go last here. So go for your first key in the game there. Don't take okay. mine. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I will try not to. Um, <laughs> It yeah, so up. my first key to the game, if the Giants want to beat Seattle, they have to find a way to protect Daniel Jones. Um, they've been doing it a lot this season, but last year they did not. Jones was sacked 10 times in that game. He had the pick six, the Devin Witherspoon. The game was lost before there was a chance for it to be won. Uh, and that was a big problem. It was a very, very big problem. Uh that's part of the reason, too, I mentioned this, the Seahawks have won six out of the last seven matchups because they continue to dominate time of possession because they're getting to the quarterbacks, right? Even Eli struggled playing in Seattle uh, towards the back end of his career. So the only time the to recent date that the Giants won in Seattle was the Colt McCoy game back in 2020 when they won 17 to 12. Everybody was shocked that they won that game. Uh, that game, that. yeah, that game put them in first oh, place God. for like a week yeah. or two. A week yeah, or two. We played, the, yeah. we played the Cardinals the following week and lost really bad. Yeah. Yes. And then that, that was everybody's season. like, everybody, everybody's like, oh yeah, playoff team after all. And like, yeah. I guess not. we lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Swap. Never and mind. <laughs> I I think too. Look, no one's ever going to agree on everything, right? You want to convince John Mara and the front office that. Again, this is going to sound silly because it's year six, but we're talking in their lens. He has enough time, Daniel Jones does, to make enough plays to determine to them, not to us, not to the people watching, to them, that it is time to move on, go out, and get another quarterback in 2025, uh, You know, whether it be Carson Beck or somebody of that nature. Um, this will determine whether or not Big Blue drafts a quarterback. Because you have, you guys mentioned Derek Hall, Boya Mafe, if he plays, even Draymond Jones and Jaron Reed have done a good job at getting to the quarterback. Um, and yeah, so I think realistically, you want the line to continue to play well and you want to protect Jones, especially if he doesn't have Malik neighbors, because it's going to take receivers more time to get open and get more route separation if Malik is not out there. Yeah. I mean, kind of jumping off of that, talking about the line. And this was kind of my key to the game going into it. And then after Drew just started dishing out all that, 
information on Walker and Sharps, it's like, we got to stop the run. Like, that's kind of the bottom line here. Um, a defensive line I meant earlier. But, uh, but you know, it's kind of like if they're going to be scoring a lot during the run game, like, that's what we need to focus on. Because, yes, of course, I mean, DK, uh, JSN, Lockett, those guys have to be protected, obviously. But, you know, their, their strength is especially because Walker's completely healthy now. Um, and like you were saying before, you know, Charbonnet is somebody who was able to step up to the plate and get the job done while Walker was still, um, getting back from his injury, but it's, it's kind of the bottom line here. It, it's, and if we don't, then they're going to start. I mean, I think Kenneth Walker had like 54, 55 fantasy points last week. Like we can't let things like that. I know we can't say fantasy yeah. points as a stat per se, but like 55 really. Spot. <laughs> Yeah. That's insane. I was I thought it was a lot when Derrick Henry got me 39 and like that, you know, it's crazy. But um, but yeah, I think that's kind of the bottom line here. Stop these guys, contain them, and you know, Dexter Lawrence, like you guys, like come on, just just keep on and, and they're doing a great job doing that. Like just really punch it. Yeah. Uh we're gonna flip the line of scrimmage and talk about our own game because they need to show off. Because if we have a output like we did in Dallas. Like this game's over before he even starts. Like they need to start running that ball down deep to give Jones, like what's the old saying, the run sets up the pass. So if we're missing neighbors and Wandell's not playing at a hundred percent, we need to set up this run game. And if Singletary's not there, then it's turbo time. Let's go. Turbo time. Ah. It is not a tumor. <laughs> yeah. I want to have my football. <laughs> uh. You know, for me, the big thing is here, guys, is is the me. I, I, I kind of alluded to it when we're talking about the defense here. For us, is we have to be able to stop this trio of receivers, and that is so much easier said than done. Gino has been playing very good, and their receivers, quite frankly, are better than our corners, and we have to figure out a way to stop them. Whether it's getting help from you know the safeties at that point to help be in the position to help. You know, guys like Banks at that point, whether it's getting the pass rush going so that Gino doesn't have as much time to throw the ball, we have to figure out a way to help these corners because they're not good enough to do on their own yet. They're young. They're inexperienced. They're still learning. I still think Banks right now really should be a CB2, and I, I really wish we had gotten an actual CB1 at least for one year. You know, maybe Stefan Gilmore was the right move. I don't know. But, you know, it is what it is. That's, that's revisionist history and going back. We got what we got. They need help. We got to figure out a way to stop the, this trio from doing it because, you know, they're just they're so much hands down better than our secondary, and it's it's a little scary when you got those three that you're facing. It's not you're trying to stop one guy. It's not you're trying to stop two guys. You're trying to stop three guys, and either of those three can take over a game when meet and be. So, you know, we got to figure that part of it out there. So, um, real quick, because I know Tom, I know you got to go in here in a moment there. Let's go back one more time around. Who you got to win? Yeah, look, so I think the Giants will be able to hold up the run game. I think Shane Bowen's defense will improve week in and week out. You know, a couple guys we didn't talk about tonight quickly here. Bobby O'Karake and Mike McFadden, uh, in my opinion, two of the best inside linebackers in the NFC, possibly even NFL this season. Uh, they will take care of business and force Geno into third and long. It's going to be a long day for the Giants. Do successfully stop the run. But, uh, Gino, I think Metcalf is going to burn us for a touchdown or two, potentially. Uh, Banks has given up touchdowns. And, again, it hasn't been bad coverage. It's been tight coverage. But the receivers have just beaten them. These receivers that are scoring on them are elite receivers, really good receivers. Banks is a good corner right now playing average, below average a little bit. Uh with that being said, and going up on the road, I think Seattle is going to make enough plays to win. Uh, final score, Seahawks 23, Giants 17. Look, I think it's a close game, and I do think there's a legitimate chance the Giants could pull this out. You guys mentioned the right side of the line. Throw the house there, right? Jason Pinnock, who loves to flirt at the line of scrimmage the entire game, get him to the quarterback. McFadden, have him blitz through the middle. Uh disguise that in a certain way and there's a chance to win this game will they do that effectively enough though 
my answer right now is no, and I'm leaning Seattle by six. Yeah, I, I'm doing the same um, in terms of Seattle covering as well. Um, I I think every week this so far this season, I've chosen the Giants to win this to win a game, and I've just constantly going confident, constantly going confident. And unfortunately, this is going to be my first time. I'm not going to be picking the Giants. I think Seattle's going to win this game. Um, I'm going to say 26 to 20. Um, you know, Tom, you kind of you kind of put the cherry on top of it all here. It's just like DK Metcalf, freaking nature. This team doing well on a high despite the loss. Um, you know, on Monday, Geno Smith resurgence. You know, we've talked about all of it. I just. I, I just don't feel confident enough in this team right now to expect a win um, in terms of, you know, going up against the Seahawks. 